Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this uh, morning session uh, on uh, optimizing the pelvic floor. My name is uh, Tommaso Simoncini, and, uh, and I come from Pisa, Italy, and uh, I have the pleasure this morning to co-chair together with Tommy Mikola from uh, Finland, Helsinki, uh, this session. Uh, we have uh, uh, four speakers uh, today, so um, we're really glad that, that we can start on time, uh, and thank you for being here today. Uh, let me take the pleasure to introduce the first uh, distinguished speakers, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, yeah, this will be very easy because there's uh, very few persons in the world who really don't need an introduction in this field, uh, like Professor Delancey. Uh, the title is uh, The Pelvic Floor Laid Open, and I think uh, he will give us uh, a fantastic introduction to the session uh, and his visionary uh, research uh, uh, in this field. Professor Delancey. Great. Thank you very much. It's a real, um, a real treat to be able to be here with you and to have some time to talk a little bit about the pelvic floor. Um, the age spectrum of these two diseases is so similar that it's, it's really appropriate that a menopause organization thinks about what's going on. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on what's going on about understanding the causes of pelvic floor disorders because most of the things that I learned and that are written in most of the textbooks uh, turn out to be provably wrong. And when you have the wrong concept behind your treatments, uh, things don't go well. And so what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the research that we've been doing trying to understand what's going on. And I've always thought about us as a research group kind of like these pilots in World War II who are trying to understand how a parachute works because it might be critically important to their survival. And so they're pulling on the cords to see what happens. They're feeling the tug of the wind against those cables. They're trying to understand the mechanism of what goes on. And it, in attempting to try and do that, that's like what we're trying to do with understanding how the ligaments and muscles and everything in the pelvic floor work. The problem is that up until 20 years ago, this was the view that we had, that we were allowed to see. And the concepts that you and I learned in training about what was wrong was based on this kind of view. It was a limited view, and so of course everybody would talk about what they could see. They could see this pink, shiny bulge that was coming out through the introitus. But with the advent of uh, advanced imaging, this has changed completely, because now we can see the entire picture of what's going on. We can put a coordinate system down, we can look at where things are at rest. We can look at how they move with Valsalva. And we can make measurements. Science is about making measurements. And once you have the ability to make measurements, you can test hypotheses to see what's wrong and what's right. Now, pelvic floor disorders are kind of the Rodney Danger field of, of gynecology. Uh, it's actually surprising how many women have pelvic floor disorders. Uh, this is our football stadium in, in Michigan. Uh, it holds about 110,000 people. And if you had three football stadiums full of people who had a problem, you think that you would get people's attention. And yet, despite the huge prevalence of this, and, and two-thirds of the operations done in America are done for prolapse, it's remarkable how much science has lagged in this field and how many exciting discoveries that there are still to be made. Now, people often say, well, you know, Gian, we got pretty good treatments for these kinds of things. We can operate on them, and so why are you worrying about preventing them and understanding mechanisms? Because if you look at preoperative photographs, it can look pretty good. And if you, like me, have stayed in the same hospital for 37 years operating on people, sometimes it doesn't look very good. And if you look at the best operation, the gold standard operation by the best surgeons in America, the NIH Pelvic Floor Disorders Network, is a 25% anatomical failure rate at seven years. We're not doing well. So I have the great privilege of working with biomechanical engineers. James Ashton Miller, who I've worked with for many years, father was a urologist in Bristol, wrote a textbook of urogynecology. Uh, James and I have been trying to apply the principles of engineering to the pelvic floor. And if there's a bridge failure, as you can see here, the engineers want to know what's wrong. Uh, you could say that it was the primary cables that failed. You could say that it was the roadbed that buckled. You could say that it was the secondary cables that rail, 
but are those the causes of the effects? Well, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, that failed because of harmonic oscillation because the roadbed wasn't stiff enough. They made roadbed stiffer after that, it's never happened again. Once you understand failure mechanisms, you can make changes. So the fact that we have a century of opinions about what's wrong is interesting because we don't know or we haven't known until recently because we haven't been able to test hypotheses to find out what it is. And I'd like to talk about echocardiography as a model. How many people have had an echocardiogram here? How many things do you think are listed on the report? There are probably 20. And each one has a normal range, and you can tell for that specific thing what's wrong. That's what we're doing with the pelvic floor, is we're coming up with specific measurements of each structure and whether they're normal or not. This is called stress 3D MRI, and I'll take you through what that is. Uh, this is a static MRI scan, and you can pretty easily outline the organs. Um, once you've done that in one slice, you can do that in all the slices. And once you've done that in all the slices, you hit the little magic button that says, make me a model, and then you get a three-dimensional object that is exactly what's going on in that specific woman. Now, that's all well and good. We can see uh, what's going on at rest, but that's not what you and I want to know with prolapse. We want to know what's going on with a maximal valsalva. We want to know what's going on like this. So we worked with the MRI folks at our place to come up with a sequence that we could do within the period of time that a woman could hold the prolapse maximally out. And then what you get is an actual 3D map of the prolapse. So what we have now is a scientific technique that allows us to make measurements of not only women who have prolapse, but because there's no radiation, we can get asymptomatic volunteers with proven normal support to use as a control group so that we can compare cases and controls and our science into the discussion. You can then compare uh, what's going on with prolapse and what's going on normally in a way that allows you to be able to see which of your ideas are true and which of your ideas aren't. So basically what we do is you have to come up with uh, XYZ coordinates. You have to be able to make measurements, and I won't go through the details of that, but suffice it to say that we can do that. I put a visual reference here of where the arcus tendinius is, which is where everybody has said that the vagina is attached laterally, and that if that connection fails, that the vagina falls down. That's one of the ideas that people have talked about. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit and show you the measurement scheme. So the apex, the cardinal and the uterosacral ligaments that have been uh, a critical aspect of pelvic organ support are measured from the side of the cervix to the little dot is at the top of the greater sciatic foramen, which is where the cardinal ligament originates. You can also look at the distance from the arcus tendineus to the side of the vagina. That's the perivaginal distance. You can look at the length of the vagina you can look at the width of the vagina, and that way you can get measurements that you can compare between cases and controls. Now I want you to just guess for a second which things you think are going to be the most different with a cystocele. Do you think that it's the width of the vagina gets wider? Uh, do you think that it's the length of the vagina that gets wider? Do you think that it's apical descent or perivaginal descent? What is it that you think might be going on in these individuals? Well, here's an individual with prolapse, just to show that we can make the same kind of measurements on the women with prolapse that we can with the women with normal support. Now, let's go back to the bridge. You saw that there was fraying of the primary cables. You saw that there was failure of the secondary cables. You saw each of these things. So now we have to say which of those things are actually wrong and different between these two different groups. And there are lots of hypotheses. If you think that it's a midline failure in the vagina, which was the genesis of the ill-fated mesh operation, because it was said that you need a patch on there to close this hole that's in the fascia. Perivaginal defect, you would see lateral descent of the vagina. Apical uh, uh, problems, you'd see descent of the apex. And then with injury to the levator ani muscle, you'd see a gaping introitus and levator injury. Um, for those of you that are taking pictures, I did uh, give them permission to put the presentation online. So it's not so that you can't take pictures now, but it should be, it should be available online afterwards. 
Okay, so this was the study that we did. This was a study that Luyan Chen, one of the biomechanical engineers, and I did. We took a group of individuals who had cystoceles that were at least a centimeter below the hymenal ring. So these were the kinds of typical cystoceles that we'd see in clinical practice. So those are the cases. Then we advertised to find women who had normal support to be able to uh, uh, identify individuals who we could use as controls, and we did 3D stress MRIs in all of these women. So here's the data for vaginal wall factors. Uh, and as you can see, the blue are the controls and the pink color are the cases. So you can see that the length of the vagina is 25% longer. Now, how many of you were taught that the vagina was longer in women with cystocele? I certainly wasn't. That wasn't something. I kind of, it was implied to me that it was too wide. And which is wider? The controls. The idea that it's the width is an optical illusion. The vagina is wider in the upper part than in the lower part, and when the wide upper part becomes visual, visible at the introitus, we think that it's wider even though it's not. This is the second study that we did this in. We had another earlier study that showed that, so this has replicated it, and anybody else who takes the time to do this will confirm that it's not wider, it's longer. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some women who have a wider vagina, but certainly it's not the dominant thing that's going on. So it's this upper vagina coming into view that's the thing that makes us think that. So what about apical and perivaginal attachments? These are the places that the vagina is attached to the hymenal ring. And you can see from the, the two little asterisks there that each of these are highly significant, less than 0.001. This is what the problem is. It is the fact that the vagina is not attached in the way that it should normally be attached. Now, what about the hiatus? Um, this is the area that none of us really uh, understood very well and I think still don't understand as well. But you can see that the size of the urogenital hiatus, that, that kind of boat-shaped opening that we saw in that picture, is actually 55% larger in women with prolapse. And how much work do you think has been done on what we do surgically and its ability to return that to normal? And I'd like to talk a little bit about that because that I see is the next horizon for us being able to face the fact that we have so many operative failures. It's a paper that we did in 1993. It does not take complicated equipment for you to prove this to yourself. It takes a ruler. How many people have heard that the perineal body is deficient in people who have prolapse? Is it true? No. Perineal body is no thicker or thinner in people with prolapse than people who don't have. It's the distance from the pubic bone to the front of the perineal body that's determined by the levator ani muscle and fascial tissues that hold it up. That is a huge difference between what's going on with women who have prolapse and women with normal support. So how important are each of these factors? Well, we talked about apical and perivaginal, and when you do um, a regression analysis, you can see that um, apical descent is responsible for 78% of cystocele, and perivaginal is responsible for 82. You can all add, that's 160%, and the reason that it's 160% is that those are basically collinear. They're basically two different measurements of the same phenomenon. The uterus is coming down and the vagina is coming down. Uh, the R value is 0.84, which is a very strong correlation. These are two different measurements of the same thing. Vaginal length is responsible for 28%. Vaginal width is not, as we've seen before. And the hiatus is, uh, is um, responsible for 62%. So this is the collinear triad of prolapse. It's apical descent, perivaginal descent, and hiatus enlargement. These are the primary causal factors. So um, how do we do surgically with these kinds of things? Um, this, again, is study, uh, some work that Lu Yun Chen and I have been doing, and we looked at our success of our operations. So these operations are all done by board-certified, experienced urogynecologists in our unit. These are people that do this all the time. They're not novices. Um, one of the things that you can see, this display is uh, on the left-hand side are the points for these 10 people before the surgery. 
The dark blue and the light blue is the normal range that we've established from, um, from some normal volunteers. And you can see that in all but one individual, we get the apex back up into a perfectly normal place. So surgically, we do a great job with the apex. Perivaginal location is very interesting. Not a single one of these patients had a perivaginal repair. Not a single one had a perivaginal repair. And yet, when you look at our ability to get things into the normal range, it's very, very good in the upper vagina. Just saying that if you re-elevate the vagina, the perivaginal gap problem goes away, that that's two aspects of the same thing. Distally in the vagina, the side that's over towards me, we don't do quite as well because that's part of the hiatus and that's part of the theme that I'd like to develop with you. So how is this clinically relevant? Well, if you look at the statements from professional organizations, they see everybody needs to have an apical suspension. One size fits all. We're not going to think about this. We're just going to do things like robots. And my question is, can't you identify individuals who do and individuals who don't? So certainly apex is important. We're not saying that it's not important. But if you look at a group of uh, normal controls and you look at individuals with cystocele, you can see that about 30% of people don't have apical prolapse and have a cystocele. Just like with blood sugar or blood pressure or ejection fraction, you can decide who's normal and you can make a decision based on whether it's normal or not. Now, I'd like to show you whether selective surgery works. This is a slightly different question. We decided to look at whether or not um, doing a high uterosacral or a sacrospinous was necessary because that's what everybody said is you have to do those. And I'd learned to operate without doing those. Not that I can't do those operations, and I've done probably 1,200 uh, Michigan four-wall sacrospinuses. I can do those pretty easily. But it just didn't seem that the morbidity was worth it. And so uh, in our own unit, we have a difference of practice between myself and some of my partners. So we decided to look at the outcomes. So we looked at people who had what the regular societies recommend, uh, and then just reattaching the ligaments at the time of the surgery rather than doing a high uterosacral or a sacrospinous. So these were people in whom the cervix wasn't more than like three centimeters below the hymen in the operating room, and in whom I felt that the tissues were adequate. And I realized that that's pretty subjective. So if you look at the long-term success rate from these, you can see that the reattachment strategy had an 88% success rate, and the vaginal culpapexy, that sacrospinous or high uterosacral, had an 81%. Well, the prolapses were a centimeter larger in that group, and so we did a statistical adjustment, and the, the results are the same. So you can decide who needs what operation, and the payoff for that is that there were fewer abscesses, there were fewer nerve injuries, there were fewer readmissions, and there was a lot less time spent with the ureter that wasn't squirting and the uterosacral ligament stitches that had to be taken out and replaced and those kinds of things. So it is possible to come up with measurements that then will be able to drive practice without sacrificing, uh, without sacrificing success. So what about the hiatus? How well do we as surgeons do with the hiatus? Well, here's the same kind of plot. Uh, on the left, you can see how we do with apical suspension, 90%. And in American schools, that would be an A. And in the hiatus size, we get an F. I'm not sure in other countries how they do grading in high school. but uh, And we're not even working on it. That's the disappointing thing. We're doing a bad job, and we don't realize that we're doing a bad job. Because all people do is they say, well, the wall is too far down. Well, the wall's too far down because the muscles aren't closing things. And I don't have time to go through all the exciting work that's going on, not only about preventing injury to the levators uh, during vaginal birth, but also the fact that we need to be able to understand what's wrong and be able to address that because that's the area that we're failing. Everybody's talking about the apex, which is, you know, that was the story from 10 years ago. And certainly people need to have an apical suspension if they've got enough prolapse. But the hiatus is, I think, the coming area. And for the young people in the audience who are thinking about a research career, this is a really interesting area to work in. So the open hiatus uh, is seen as operative failure. On the top uh, is a preoperative photograph of a woman. On the bottom is the photograph of the same woman. 
She had a posterior repair at the time of the surgery. Her hiatus is open, and she has a rectocele. That's the thing that we're going to have to face over the course of the next several years. So I hope you've been able to see a little bit about the idea between cause and effect, the importance of understanding what it is that is actually responsible for prolapse. And I think over the next several years, there'll be a lot of new progress that you'll see scientifically in terms of us being able to answer questions about what's wrong. Oops, sorry. Hit the down button, John. So this is an evolving story. Uh, we're about where echocardiography was in 1960. And all of you know since 1960 what's happened with that field. Um, it's now possible to get an accurate structural diagnosis. Um, saying that somebody has prolapse is like some, saying that somebody has congestive heart failure. You want to know, is it a valve? Is it, the, is it the ventricle? Is it an arrhythmia? What is it? Apical descent, we're already doing a pretty good job with. Hiatus restoration is the area that we're not doing very well, well with. We specifically measure the length of the vagina before and after our anterior repair to make sure we get it back to normal because that's an important part of getting good success. Personalized surgery is feasible. It should decrease complications while preserving or improving success. And randomized trials certainly are needed once we get to the point of being able to say, we think that this should be done by everybody. Well, again, I'd like to thank the organizers for the privilege of being able to be here with you. And we'll do questions at the end if there's time. On now. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, for the kind introduction. And let me move uh, ahead uh, uh, with this talk. So advances in surgical strategies uh, are uh, absolutely uh, intriguing in, uh, in this area. Um, as uh, we've heard before with a beautiful lecture from Professor Delancey, it's really an antique art, uh, understanding why things happen. And we're really far from uh, understanding it uh, correctly. Uh, but the urogynecologist within the uh, surgeons uh, in the pelvis is probably uh, the type of surgeon that has most uh, 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 strived to find ways uh, that try to accomplish things uh, uh, better and better. That, that is why we have so many procedures uh, historically and why there is so much discussion yet today on which procedure may be more suited uh, to uh, each problem. And, and I agree also it is very important that uh, the menopause societies start to think, uh, to, to talk about this problem because, uh, of course, uh, pelvic organ prolapse is a lifetime problem. Uh, and uh, menopause is certainly a time in a woman's life uh, when uh, uh, we do st uh, start seeing things uh, happen. So we are really, as menopause physicians and urogynecologists in some instances, at the right time uh, to identify problems uh, and to start uh, strategies which may uh, uh, be uh, broadly uh, intervening at the time of prevention, slowing down the uh, um, um, uh, emergency of problems and uh, uh, surgical interventions as well. And the reason why this happens is, uh, is complex, uh, but for sure, uh, we do understand uh, absolutely that the menopausal changes uh, carry on uh, structural modifications in the pelvic floor that go well beyond what we as menopause physicians have been uh, uh, used to discuss. It's not just vaginal atrophy, there's much more than that. And it's still uh, yet here a field of investigation. So we don't have that uh, uh, broad amount of data on why the change hormonal levels or the aging process at this time in a woman's life carries uh, all these changes in the structural and muscular and nerve uh, um, function of uh, a woman's pelvis. And all these uh, things uh, uh, have to do with the development uh, and the worsening of uh, pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence as well. Now, the other part of the story is that uh, uh, aging women are much different than they used to be 20 or 40 years ago. Uh, the requests for uh, uh, quality of life for women with pelvic organ problems are entirely different. It's not just uh, uh, take me out that bulge. It's take me out that bulge because I want to exercise. I want to go to the gym. I want to hike. I want to ski. Uh, and, and this you know, quality of life and activity is 
is really extending uh, with activities that we were not uh, used to see before. Sexual function, but also aesthetical uh, issues are more important now, and we get that type of request. Uh, so this is why we were not just uh, uh, anymore thinking about just repair, but repair in ways that suit all these uh, uh, requests by uh, our women. And therefore, durability of surgery is something that uh, is becoming an issue, uh, along with the function uh, of that surgery, also in elderly women. And this is very important because in order to do that, uh, there's many things where we may uh, um, intervene and have uh, uh, improvements. This is along things of uh, uh, areas where I do see uh, space uh, for intervention, which I'll not uh, have the time to cover. But there is a lot uh, uh, that we can do to predict, to prevent uh, uh, from the delivery room and on. Uh, and, but there's many things that do not directly apply to new strategies in surgery. So let me go directly to this part, which I uh, want to cover a little bit more in, in, uh, in uh, detail. So first of all, uh, as, as we've heard before, uh, there's uh, different types uh, of prolapses. And while we discuss uh, what is maybe more appropriate uh, in, uh, in all of these prolapses, uh, uh, for sure when we have advanced prolapse, uh, then we are challenged uh, with these uh, issues that I said before more than when we have uh, uh, more selective prolapses, where we can discuss uh, what is the best way uh, uh, to, to, to approach. And, and in these cases, as you all know, we have the highest rate of relapse, uh, and this is where really the efforts uh, for improvements in durability and uh, uh, prevention of recurrence and uh, 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 recurrent surgeries uh, have been uh, the topic of discussion for many, many years. And that's where the story of uh, vaginal surgery uh, has brought to newer development in our development of this surgery. So uh, vaginal surgery is uh, where we've heard, uh, where we've all uh, started, uh, and, and the, the correct way to learn uh, uh, pelvic organ prolapse surgery. But then uh, we've understood uh, in, uh, that in these types of prolapses, it has uh, some limits. And therefore, uh, abdominal surgery strategies uh, have intervened historically, uh, bringing some differences in terms of strategy. So uh, rather than repairing and uh, attaching things uh, from below, suspending things uh, from uh, uh, the apex, which is very different from recreating uh, a correct anatomy, but using a different strategy that uh, has a different impact in the long term uh, on how things uh, stay in, the, in their place within the pelvis rather than bulging out. However, this uh, has come uh, uh, at the uh, uh, price uh, of a higher mobility because uh, traditionally these were open surgeries. And you all know the uh, mesh, the vaginal mesh uh, story that it came in in order to uh, address uh, the issue of durability and it carried all the problems that we've uh, uh, come to know uh, in the past few years. So minimal invasive has been uh, the uh, area of development in the past few years, uh, and, and this is really the area where the, uh, I would like to concentrate, uh, because I think it's interesting for many reasons. First of all, most of the surgeons uh, that are growing up in gynecology are primarily minimally invasive surgeons, meaning laparoscopic surgeons. This is uh, uh, the way that most of our residents train, and they have skills uh, that are certainly unprecedented, so uh, our masters didn't have their ability to do things uh, mean invasively as they are uh, able to do now. So uh, it's, it, it, it will come handy that uh, those are strategies that can be used uh, to restore the pelvic organ uh, prolapse uh, uh, through the, the abdominal route in a mean invasive fashion can be standardized and can be implemented. And I think the other uh, way to see this is that uh, for many reasons that I will touch upon later, uh, there's many things that can be done in a different way and then can use uh, technical implementation while you work uh, uh, with main invasive uh, strategies. So it's really interesting to look into this uh, uh, enticing and, and intriguing area of development. So let me touch on improved technology, which is really uh, where all our world is going, from telephones to cars. Uh, uh, we are in times of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So everything that's technological comes uh, as uh, an apparent revolution. And uh, you're all aware, and I will touch on this, uh, that uh, 
we are living at a time where robotic surgery is becoming a, a must. The people are looking uh, for surgery done with the assistance of robots because it's really fancy. And uh, it certainly has a number of advantages and it, it gives you the uh, ability to do surgery in a slightly different way than, uh, and probably in a slightly better way than uh, with traditional mean invasive laparoscopic surgery. But the real placement and the correct role of these uh, technology in uh, uh, gynecological surgery, general surgery, and particularly urogynecology is still to be uh, understood. But of course, accuracy, dexterity, and, and skills, uh, short learning curve, uh, and uh, the ability to spread uh, the diffusion of uh, surgery that are quite complex, uh, like uh, 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 pelvic organ prolapse uh, uh, abdominal surgery, uh, certainly uh, deserve uh, uh, attention uh, for, these, uh, uh, for this type of strategy. And indeed, uh, it, it adds a new armamentarium uh, to uh, uh, the surgeon. Uh, so you, you have more, uh, um, uh, more tools uh, to uh, approach. But particularly the uh, areas where those people who use the robot uh, to do pelvic organ prolapse surgery and, and also use other techniques uh, feel uh, they have some advantages are the complex cases, uh, those uh, that really require additional skills. Uh, and, uh, but also in the normal uh, procedures, uh, there are some uh, sets uh, of uh, surgical uh, um, uh, times, uh, surgical uh, um, uh, maneuvers uh, that are really uh, uh, done in a different way, and the perception is that uh, these are easier and more appropriate with robot. Uh, complication, fast learning curve, uh, these are really interesting, but uh, where I th really see the most uh, is the technological implementation, because uh, uh, if we refer, and this is not uh, the only area where we would like to uh, discuss uh, to the traditional and, and gold standard uh, operation that is done uh, through the abdomen, that is the sacral suspension of the apex, uh, anterior, posterior vagina, cervic, uh, cervix or vaginal cuff, or whatever the condition is. Uh, um, this is certainly a very good procedure, uh, which is also a very complex procedure. But it carries uh, m many advantages in terms of uh, durability, sexual function, and there's uh, some of these uh, uh, advantages that we've not really understood at length, uh, which may push uh, for a broader uptake of this uh, type of surgery for advanced prolapse. One of the reasons is uh, uh, maybe, and, and this may apply particularly to, to a menopausal congress like this is, is the fact that with uh, uh, avoiding opening the vagina, but doing everything through a sterile field, we're not facing uh, the fact that the bacterial contamination of the vagina uh, may alter the result of the surgery particularly after the menopause, when we all know that uh, the microbiome is changing. Whether this has any influence on results, or durability, uh, efficacy, we don't know. But on the other side, particularly when we uh, consider doing this surgery in elder people, uh, in persons where the bladder function is uh, much uh, uh, more vulnerable due to the aging process of the bladder, and, uh, and then you have a lot of uh, 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 very often uh, un, uh, not identified uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, uh, particularly uh, avoiding difficulties uh, and uh, um, uh, hypoactivity of the detrusor muscle. It's not the same to do suspension surgery through the abdomen where you mostly work on the apex uh, rather than doing it uh, transvaginally, particularly if you have a, such a big prolapse uh, as before. And so uh, this is likely why uh, those people who start and continue doing uh, abdominal surgery, particularly if you can offer it uh, through a minimal invasive way, do experience that with advanced prolapse, uh, uh, this is a very good surgery for all these reasons. So why should we consider then uh, technological implementation to aid uh, in approaching this surgery? Because the sacral suspension is a difficult procedure. You all know when, when you go to surgical uh, congresses, uh, it is uh, uh, identified with the top difficulty in minimal invasive surgery, along with uh, lomboartic uh, uh, lymph node dissection or radical uh, hysterectomy. So it's not an easy uh, procedure because of all these uh, uh, technical issues, and, and it can be also dangerous. So one thing, uh, since uh, most of us uh, work in university settings, or so we have the, had the experience of uh, uh, having to train person, is how you teach. 
And uh, teaching this type of procedure uh, is uh, uh, slightly changing. And, and we need to start uh, uh, understanding that uh, teaching abdominal surgery and teaching vaginal surgery is not the same thing because of uh, uh, many issues. One issue is the fact that uh, most uh, of our residents and young surgeons uh, do use a lot uh, uh, internet-based tools uh, to learn, to see procedures, because that is cheap, it's easy, and sometimes you can see very beautiful procedures performed by uh, uh, fantastic surgeons uh, on your telephone while you're on uh, the metro going to the hospital, and that also carries you experience, uh, uh, which is very much difficult, much more difficult, I would say, not impossible, but very much more difficult to do uh, uh, in learning vaginal surgery where you really need your, your hand and your finger in that tissue to understand uh, through experience uh, what you have to do to do it correctly. And uh, as we've uh, seen before, there's a lot of technological advancement that allow us uh, to build up uh, three-dimensional models to understand better pelvic uh, anatomy. Learning through simulation is much easier, uh, much more easily done for abdominal uh, surgery, and it's, it's optimized for minimal invasive surgery and robotic surgery even more than that. So we have more chances to try and have our residents uh, uh, um, exercising with these procedures, uh, with these uh, computer-based uh, uh, platforms. And also, the other advantage uh, of uh, the robotic platform, which goes even beyond that of minimal invasive laparoscopic surgery, is, is, is uh, you can really teach person uh, like in a driving school. So you sit uh, with two consoles, and you have the person uh, doing the procedure, and you can take uh, uh, the, the lead and leave uh, uh, the autonomy to the, the, to, the, to the person you are teaching. And this is actually uh, verifiable by the uptake of robotic surgery, uh, and this is data coming from the United States, where, uh, as I said, uh, robotic surgery is even a little bit too fancy and moved by, by things uh, which uh, are not necessarily linked to efficacy. But if you look at uh, the amount of uh, hysterectomies or cyclocolpopexy uh, being done by laparoscopy or being done by robotic surgery, you do, so how, do, do see how quicker it is the uptake of this procedure with robotic surgery. So this really means uh, that when you, particularly with cyclocolpopexy, if you have a difficult technique, if you have something that helps you doing uh, that surgery, this may really have a role in uh, allowing you to do that surgery safely and possibly correctly. But the other thing is uh, that uh, uh, we are now uh, facing a, a, a platform that allows you to do surgery helped uh, with a computer, which is very important because uh, that is really uh, where the future is going. So everything will be more and more uh, aided by computer uh, programs and, and artificial intelligence, as I said. So uh, the fact that we have now these incredible tools uh, with sonography, with uh, MRI to uh, identify and reconstruct uh, pelvic floor anatomy allows us uh, to do something that is even more general which is the reconstruction of the specific defect of a single patient. And in the future, we will be able to do surgery knowing exactly what is the defect in that person. And planning the surgery will be easier and more tailored. But how can we do that? Because there's many, and you've seen the, this data before, so I don't have the, uh, the need to explain these models. But there's many things that can already be done and that they're easy uh, to be done. These are models of pelvis uh, where we, we also have uh, uh, biomedical engineers uh, and radiologists who are interested in uh, building up re uh, reconstruction of uh, 3D at anatomy. And there's something that is very easy to be done, which is really, the, so for instance, uh, the uh, identification and three-dimensional reconstructions of the vessels, ureters, and the bone uh, is very easy because these structures do not move uh, in, the, in the pelvis. Uh, and uh, these are extremely important. For instance, when you want to approach uh, um, sacral colpopexy because the most uh, uh, dangerous step is the dissection of the promontorium where you may encounter the left iliac vein and cause a very uh, dangerous bleeding. So these are examples of, of patient-specific uh, anatomies reconstructed uh, through CT scans, but you can do that with MRI. And you see there's ways to overimpose and to do navigation, uh, which uh, you can achieve uh, with a robotic platform. This is work we're doing uh, right now 
which could really help uh, uh, the surgeon approaching these procedures, particularly in the early uh, stages of their uh, experience, uh, but also in cases where these dissection is difficult, previous surgeries, very fat patients, uh, uh, in order to increase the safety of the procedure and to allow a person to. And it's easier to do this with a robot uh, than with laparoscopic surgery. So it's not just a, a way to do surgery differently. Uh, but a way to do surgery with uh, a different uh, assistance. And the other thing, you could uh, eventually tailor surgery in terms of identifying how long is the defect, uh, how, uh, where, what is the best uh, uh, point on the promontory where you should attach the, uh, your mesh, uh, what is the amount of suspension you should give that apex. Uh, it's really sartorial, and depending on the experience of the surgeon, how much you suspend during a sacral, Colpopexy, the apex. And if you do it too much, you're going to have pain or failure. If you do it not enough, uh, your correction will not be efficient. So this is very interesting. But there's not just this. So we're living in times where the technological uh, advancement is, is very quick. This is the generation of the robots. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, a few days ago, for the last week actually, uh, the Da Vinci uh, uh, has been implemented yet more with the uh, clearance by the FDA for urological applications of uh, the, sing the new single side procedure. So all the surgery in all the fields is moving towards uh, 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 a much uh, uh, lower uh, invasivity by using single side accesses, uh, which provide uh, similar experiences and similar safety and efficacy for the surgeon to do to the surgery. And uh, this is extremely interesting because particularly in a field uh, like uh, pelvic organ Plurops restoration, where you want to have uh, uh, the most out of quality of life improvement, so the less you are invasive with surgery, the most you can do for, for your woman. This is extremely interesting. And uh, single side surgery, it is extremely difficult for advanced prolapse uh, with the Da Vinci procedure. You can achieve it, at least with, for some surgeries. So this is certainly an interesting way to go, which uh, we will be forced to follow because uh, the patients. Uh, are now looking over the internet for procedures and they're challenging us uh, in order to, uh, to be able to do things. But uh, the future to me is much more than this. It's, uh, it's really to uh, what spread uh, uh, much more the uh, knowledge of the people who engage in this surgery in, uh, in being able to uh, treat uh, at, uh, um, you know, uh, in a round way uh, uh, our women uh, uh, being uh, aware that it's not just a suspension surgery, it's not just an anatomical correction surgery. It is a surgery where you have to take into consideration whatever you do, the problem that that woman has that go beyond uh, the defect that you are seeing and approaching surgically. Uh, we now know that everything we do has a, a, a reflection, has a consequences on uh, 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 on uh, bowel function, uh, on urinary function, sexual function. So the pelvic floor view should be broader than uh, uh, it used to be. And this is extremely important because it requires uh, not necessarily surgical skills. You can have additional surgeons helping you, but culture is important. So my, my, my view is that in the future for pelvic organ prolap surgery, we have many, many uh, uh, possibilities that come through the technological improvements uh, that are coming uh, particularly through the newer technologies. So robotics is particularly interesting in this field. But going mean invasively, tailoring surgery with a view on multidisciplinary approach is important. On the other side, we need to take into account that everything uh, uh, needs to be reminded. And this evolution is not just an evolution on, uh, on, on in one direction. The difficult part uh, is to try and uh, keep uh, uh, the broader view that all the surgical techniques are very important and the best surgeon is the one that can uh, tailor the surgery on the defect. So to be able not to go towards the computer and stay there, but to be able also to be a little bit more primitive in some ways uh, by using the cartoon that I'm showing you and being able to do all the surgeries is also extremely important. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tommy. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm going to change the tack slightly now, and we're going to talk about urinary incontinence. We've concentrated rather on prolapse up till now. But a lot of the 
principles that have been talked about apply for incontinence as well. Let's get the thing to work. Okay, fine. Okay, these are my declaration of interests, and uh, as in relation to this talk, I am a board member of the International Menopause Society. I've been a past secretary of the British Urogynecology Society. And I'm also the Royal College lead for patient safety and have been very much involved in the UK response to the mesh uh, situation, which I will refer to a bit later on. So urinary incontinence is extremely common, and we often talk about the iceberg of incontinence. And this really reflects the fact that there's a large number of people at the bottom who have urinary incontinence, estimated to be over 40% of women over the age of 40, with a smaller number of women who actually seek care, an even smaller number of women who actually get care once they try and seek it, and then a fairly small proportion at the top who actually get specialist care for their problem. So when I talk about urinary incontinence, we're really referring to the very top, but as I think as somebody asked earlier on, in the community, actually, it's the bottom that we're trying to deal with. And the other important emphasis is that actually of this survey, the majority of these women had moderate to severe symptoms. So we are failing a lot of these people at the bottom of this iceberg who have moderate to severe symptoms. Often they've had for more than two years, and yet they're not really getting appropriate care. And if we look at this, the stratification of the different types of urinary incontinence by age, don't get too worried about the detail in this slide. The, the point is the... Uh, Urinary incontinence of stress, which is in the blue, peaks around the time of the menopause. Uh, the urgency, which is, has two peaks, one in relatively young women and another in the older women, and the mixed incontinence is greatest, really, in the middle ages. So in a menopause context, we're dealing with the, the middle part of this graph where we've got a large amount of stress incontinence and a large amount of mixed incontinence. And there are, for the purposes of this talk, three principal types of urine incontinence, which is defined as any involuntary leakage of urine. And this can either be due to an overactive bladder, principally the symptoms of urge incontinence, urgency, frequency, and nocturia, or stress incontinence, which is leakage of urine on exertion, sneezing, or coughing, or as we've seen quite commonly, both are coexisting together. The impact of this is quite significant, and this is probably the key point, is what impact is it? As we've talked about prolapse already, it's okay if the patient's got a prolapse. If it's not bothering them, then maybe it's not important to deal with it. Similarly, with urinary incontinence, there are some women who have urinary incontinence and it doesn't bother them, in which case there's no real issue as far as we're concerned. But it's the impact for those that it does bother that we need to assess. And this can have a major impact on quality of life, with loss of self-esteem and a desire to normalize and just be able to go out and function normally. Urinary incontinence is also associated with other comorbidities, hip fracture and depression being a number, and also women with urinary incontinence more commonly report menopausal symptoms. And of course there's the cost, both the personal cost and the social costs and the healthcare costs of urinary incontinence, which can be quite massive and are very difficult to fully evaluate. As far as the initial assessment is concerned, this is an algorithm we've used in our hospital for many years based on, on many other algorithms similarly. But essentially, the first point is a clinical assessment and to rule out what we call the red flag. So hematuria, urinary tract infection, pelvic mass. If they exist, clearly you deal with that. But assuming they are not there, then you deal with the predominant symptom. If a woman has predominantly stress incontinence, you go down what is on your screen, the left-hand side, so they go down to pelvic floor re-education. Uh, if they have predominantly urge or urge incontinence, then you go down to bladder retraining and anticholinergic side. And if they have mixed symptoms, you can choose which one you go down first, depending on the predominance of their symptoms. And only then, if the symptoms persist, do they then really need to have specialist referral, because most of that can be done with sensible and, and appropriate community support. So the key principles of managing women with urine incontinence is first of all to assess their impact on their quality of life. Is it bothering them? And if so, how much and what, in what context? A fluid balance chart, it's incredibly cheap and simple to do, but actually it's very important in assessing and helping the woman to understand actually how her bladder works. It's amazing how many people do not realize that if you drink four liters of fluid a day, you will end up going to the toilet a lot. 
And you do need to emphasize that and help people engage in that and try and encourage their own, them to take ownership of their own problem. If I have three glasses of beer before I go to bed at night, it's quite likely I'm going to get up in, during the night. If I don't want to get up in the night, I don't drink the beer. It's quite simple. But again, you need to sometimes get patients to engage on that. We live in a society where everybody wants a solution to their problem, and it's your, your job as the doctor to give me that solution. We need to turn that around and let the patient be the one who's in control. Weight loss, another factor in that, very important and can have a major impact on the way women uh, manage their bladders. Pelvic floor re-education through physiotherapy and obviously depending on your circumstances how much you can advise that. Simple exercise advice is helpful but ideally a women's health specialist physiotherapist is the ideal person to assess and, and train women to manage their pelvic floor. We need to ensure adequate estrogenization, which I don't need to emphasize to this audience. And we also need to establish realistic goals of what the patient can expect from their treatment. What is it they want to achieve and what's realistic? And we need as, as physicians to try and advise them with that. And for the vast majority of women, we don't need specialist investigations, lots of imaging, urodynamics and that type of thing until we've gone through all those hurdles. And actually, a lot of women will get better just with following those simple advice strategies. And as far as urinary east, uh, vaginal estrogens are concerned, I think for this audience, really, it's just worth highlighting the importance of vaginal estrogens on the pelvic floor and on urinary incontinence. And we do know from the Hutt, initial Hutt Committee work, followed by the Cochrane meta-analyses that have been updated three times, is that estrogens not only improve urogenital atrophy, which we all know, but they also reduce the risk of recurrent urinary tract infections. They improve some of the sensory symptoms of the bladder, urgency, frequency, and nocturia. They can increase bladder capacity and first sensation to void, and they can help in conjunction with other treatments such as physiotherapy for the management of other pelvic floor conditions. And we also know from all the work that's been done is that low-dose vaginal estrogen tablets, which have minimal uh, risk, are as effective as systemic hormone replacement. So if you've just got a woman with urinary symptoms or pelvic floor symptoms, then vaginal estrogens are all you need to use. You don't need systemic treatment. So I just want to go through both of these major conditions a little bit more to give a, a bit more understanding of our management strategy for these. So the management of an overactive bladder, again, we've talked about the general advice, perhaps a bit of fluid restriction, avoiding caffeine, alcohol, known stimulants, and physiotherapy. If we just look at the, the, the uh, diagram on the left, the overactive bladder, in very simple terms, the bladder have stretch reflexes. And anybody who has a puppy or uh, baby will know that basically the normal reflex is that when the bladder starts to fill up, the bladder stretch reflex, stretch receptors are activated, the bladder muscle contracts and the bladder empties. And what we learn to do as we get older is basically to in control that reflex so that we don't leak inappropriately and we hold on until we get to an appropriate place to empty the bladder. But in the uh, Overactive bladder, what's happening is the stretch receptor, this reflex is working over time, and therefore the bladder is contracting and giving women the sensation they need to rush to the loo, and sometimes the bladder will contract before they get there. The medication, the treatments we have available other than the general ones are anticholinergic medication, uh, mirabegron, uh, vaginal estrogens, which we've talked about, desmopressin, which helps to reduce the fluid input into the bladder and therefore reduce the frequency, particularly at night and botulinum toxin, and I'm just going to touch on a few of these a bit more now. So the anti-muscarinics or anticholinergics have been the mainstay of the management of an overactive bladder for many, many years, and we've got an increasing number of these preparations which are listed at the top. And a variety, variety of preparations of basic, uh, sorry, international studies have shown that these are as effective, uh, more effective as placebo, and basically they all work in a broadly similar way. There are differences, but we don't have the time to, to delve into that. Effectively, they all work. The extended release preparations, which are the ones that are taken once a day, seem to have slightly superior efficacy over the ones that are taken two or three times a day. And the newer preparations tend to be more specific for the M3 receptors in the bladder. The commonest problem with these class of medication is side effects, particularly things like dry mouth. So if you're targeting the receptors that are primarily in the bladder, then you would hopefully reduce the number of side effects elsewhere and just concentrate on the bladder. And that's largely borne out by the clinical studies. But even so, a lot of side, side effects is still a common problem with this class of drug. And the typical side effects are dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, a drowsiness, and fatigue, all of which can be quite significant and lead people to stop taking the medication. 
And we do know from a variety of studies that the discontinuation rate in the first month is anything up to 80%, which clearly isn't very useful if you're trying to manage a long-term problem. Side effects tend to be dose-related and are less for the once-day preparations. And there are concerns that have more recently been highlighted about the long-term cognitive and cardiac effects of this class of drug. And therefore, there has some concern about how we prescribe it, particularly in women who may be vulnerable to these things, so those with Parkinson's or renal or hepatic impairment. So they are by no means the perfect, perfect group for us to be uh, treatment for us. And if you just look at the Adrian Wags data, looking at the discontinuation re rates in these antimuscarinics over the course of a year, you can see very quickly that within just two or three months, you're getting a, a large fallout of the number of people who are willing to take and stay on their medication. So an alternative uh, uh, a few years ago came on the market called Mirabegron or Betmega, and this works in a completely different way. This is a beta-3 adrenal receptor agonist, so if you look at this diagram on the left here, that's how the anti-muscarinics work on the bladder wall, and the beta-3 adrenal receptor agonists work in a completely different way, and effectively what they do is they cause the bladder to relax and therefore increase bladder storage, whereas the anti-muscarinics are stopping it contract, these are making it relax. So they work in a different way, they're a different class of drug, and a number of clinical studies have shown improvement in urgency and frequency episodes. On the whole, it's well tolerated, but there are still significant side effects in some groups. And the discontinuation rate with this medication appears to be less than it is with the anticholinergics. So it's certainly in our clinical practice, it's a useful second line alternative if the antimuscarinics have not been effective. Uh, or it can be used in combination with antimuscarinics, and there has been some uh, good studies to show that that can have a, a more beneficial effect. But again, looking at the discontinuation rates, although there's certainly Mirabegron has a better discontinuation rates than the anticholinergics, it, doesn't, it still has a problem with the number of women stopping to take it quite quickly after they have been prescribed it. What about botulinum toxin? It seems to be a potential solution for just about every condition in the body now, but it is actually extremely effective as far as the bladder is concerned. Um, the studies that have been done now are showing efficacy rates of 60 to 75 percent. The, um, it's an injection into the bladder. It's usually done under local anesthetic through a cystoscope. It can be done into about 20 to 30 sites, depending on, on the uh, condition. And usually we avoid the trigone of the bladder. The standard dose recommended is 100 units for overactive bladder and 200 units for a neurogenic bladder, but there are some variances on that. The main, it does work quite well, and particularly for women who've had quite significant overactive bladder that's been resistant to other options, it's really quite, it can be very effective. The downsides are that it only lasts for about 10 to 12 months, so a lot of women, most women have to come back to have it redone. And there is a retention rate of about 7 to 10 percent. So in other words, about up to 10 percent of the women will actually be going to complete urinary retention after the procedure. So it's a prerequisite before they have the procedure done that they learn to do intermittent self-catheterization. And for some people, that is a significant barrier before that to stop them going further ahead. And if you've got someone who's got, a, say, bad arthritis or some other problem, which means intermittent self-catheterization is not really feasible, then that is a, an issue as far as that's concerned. But overall, it's become a significant um, choice for us in the management of refractory overactive bladder. So I want to move on now just to talk about stress incontinence and just to, to remind you really of the anatomy of stress incontinence. The um, pelvic, normal pelvic floor is here. This is the bladder is yellow. The purple is, represents the pelvic floor and the green the urethral sphincter. And essentially if somebody coughs, laughs, jumps on a trampoline, does something energetic, then the pressure transmission in a normal continent woman is equal at the bladder neck as it is in the bladder. But in the typical stress incontinence scenario where there is urethral hypermobility, the bladder neck is not supported by the pelvic floor, and therefore the net effect of pressure on the bladder is urinary leakage. There is a less common situation where you get intrinsic sphincter deficiency, where the, bladder, the pelvic floor is actually supporting the bladder, but the sphincter itself is weak, and we tend to see that in women who've had either multiple previous surgeries or radiotherapy or something. It's a much less common problem. So the management of stress incontinence, uh, the standard management now, again, will be continue pelvic floor re-education as an absolute uh, mandatory starting point. There is some mileage in using duloxetine for medical treatment, uh, as a medical treatment, but a lot of us have not found it particularly helpful. Uh, and really, the mainstay of treatment has been is now surgery. 
There is some interest in the use of laser, as I think some of you will have heard yesterday about the, for the management of stress incontinence, but I think it's really too, uh, too early for us to say that is a significant option outside of research trials at the present time. As far as surgery is concerned, it's really down to three different options. We have an office-based procedures, such as the bulking agents. I'm going to come and talk to these in a bit more. The day case procedures, which have become the standard over the last 15 years, which are the mid-urethral mid slings. And then the major surgeries, such as colpo suspension, uh, autologous slings, and uh, artificial urinary sphincters, which were perhaps standard practice 20 years ago, but have largely slipped out of favor, but may be coming back into favor. But I think whatever type of surgery you are thinking of doing, and this would apply to prolapse surgery as well, the most important thing is to remember that these are benign conditions. And before we start operating on anybody, we need to make sure we're not going to do them any harm. Or if we are going to do them harm, they understand what those risks are, and we discuss it fully with them before beforehand. So conservative therapy. Uh, which we've heard about already with the pelvic floor re-education, can be extremely important uh, to help women control their symptoms, and it may make the difference between them deciding that actually they want surgery or they don't want surgery. It should be given by appropriately trained uh, people, and it should be continued for at least three months. But like all of us in training, you have to engage the patient in doing it. So if someone can say to you to go to the gym to lose weight, and they can take you to the gym and drive you there in the car and leave you there. But unless you actually do the work, it's not going to be effective. And you do have to get patients to engage, and some women just don't want to do that. But there are various modalities, which I don't have time to go into, but physiotherapy can be extremely effective, either on its own or even as an adjunct to, to surgery if it's not been completely successful. As far as surgery is concerned, we are all familiar with the mid urethral slings. These have become the, the standard preparation following the original work by Ulf Ulmstein back in 1998. Um, primarily, these are done under local anesthetic, or, or some people do them under general, but we do them primarily under local anesthetic. You can do a stress test at the time, and uh, the success rates with this in a large number of published trials now are consistent uh, with 80 to 90 percent continence rates with high patient satisfaction. There's been widespread acceptance of this as the standard procedure over many international publications over many years. And we now have the 18-year published follow-up data from, from the original group from, from Tommy's unit in, uh, in Finland, which again showing that about 80% of these women continue to be continent so nearly 20 years after the original surgery. So that's all the good news story. The, the problem is there are complications with surgery. We all knew about de novo urgency as a complication, voiding dysfunction, the possibility of urinary retention in a small group and about less than 1% requiring intermittent self-catheterization long-term. These are, are, are well established from a lot of the data and the recurrent urinary tract infections which go with this type of surgery are also well known. What I think has been less clear and is becoming more evident is the potential of, for these procedures to cause pain. And I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but I think if anybody who deal with mesh patients will realize that it's the pain that's become the biggest single issue that has driven this whole agenda in the last few years. And there's no doubt that for some women, pain does develop late on in the process, which was not necessarily expected. So the mesh controversy, I could talk to you for hours about it, but I won't. Um, just to summarize it in one slide, there have been huge numbers of social media campaigns. You all have your own campaigns in your own country, I suspect. Some are more active than others. Certainly, I know that uh, in, in, a, in the US, it's been very active. In, in the UK, we've had a lot of action in Scotland particularly, but more recently also in, in England. And these mesh groups have had a very powerful impact in the way that things are doing. And they've highlighted a number of failings in our profession and the way things have been dealt with. But we have to be careful that we don't throw everything away just on the basis of a social media campaign. And we need to recognize the problems that have happened, but also try and identify ways in which we can make things work in the future. So this has had a, a large international effect, both legal and through social media. There have been multiple reviews of uh, mesh usage, both in prolapse and incontinence, through in the United States, in Australasia, the European ones, in the UK. We've had four separate reviews in the UK. Uh, Four separate reviews in the UK recently um, looking at the, the use of mesh and its appropriateness. And we've also had government involvement in, in Australasia with a recent statement from their Senate. I think just to try and summarize it in, as if, uh, in one sort of half a slide, really, the instance of complications does appear to be higher than was initially anticipated from the research that was done. And I'm talking by, primarily about urine incontinence procedures. Um, I think there has been an issue about poor consent 
widespread adoption of techniques before people were appropriately trained or understood, and that goes back to Tommaso's point about who's doing the surgery. And when people have had a complication, there's often been a very poor response to the complication. We now have a situation where in many countries mesh for vaginal prolapse is, is banned or restricted, very severely restricted in its use. The mid-urethral slings are primarily still uh, available and still being used. In Australasia, which is the first one where the government actually made a, a specific recommendation, they say that the, the mid-urethral retropubic tape should be used as a last resort. Now, it depends on how you interpret that, but actually most of us would argue that surgery has always been a last resort for this type of problem, um, and therefore perhaps nothing has changed. But it may uh, uh, deflect the emphasis away from perhaps some surgeons who'd be more happy to operate without doing the appropriate workup. And I think the evidence is now tells us very clearly that of the tapes that are available, the retropubic tape is definitely the preferred method and has a lower complication rate, particularly pain, than the transobturator tape. And if we look at our database, some of you will know that in the British Society of Gynecology, we've had a database for about 10 years now where surgeons are invited to put all their data on. And we can see very clearly what's happened over the last few years. Uh, we're looking at, um, so if you look at the, sorry, retropubic tape, which is the green one, this is the instance of the use of retropubic tape peaking up here in 2014 and how that amount of tapes being used has fallen dramatically over the last few years. At the same time, um, we see an increase, significant increase in the injectables, which is this blue line here, um, and a fall off in the, uh, the obturator tape. And although the numbers are small, actually recent data have told us that the number of culpa suspensions and autologous slings has increased eightfold in the last few years. The numbers are small, so eightfold increases in huge numbers, but the trend is very much to, to stop doing retropubic tapes and to do other procedures again. So the bulking agents um, are been around for a long time, um, but the increasing evidence in, uh, is, is emerging of their success. And also because of the movement away from tapes, I think there's an increasing interest again in these agents. There are two different types. There's the hydrogels, which is contagen and bulkamed, and the particulate gels, such as macroplastic, Jurosphere, and Zuodex. Some of these have now been withdrawn. But the advantages of this type of technique is that it can be done in the office, there are minimal complications, not nil, but there are minimal complications. It's also suitable for the intrinsic sphincter deficiency group that I talked to you about. And there has always been the potential for urinary, for stress incontinence, but often it's been kept for those who had failed other surgery. And I think increasingly recognizing that as a primary group, this is actually a, quite a good option. The disadvantages, the success rate has often been reported as quite low, and you need a repeat procedure quite often within 12 months or so, and sometimes repeated repeat procedures. But new evidence is emerging of the long-term efficacy. Bulkamed, which is now the, certainly in the, in the UK, the prime uh, agent is being used. And what we're seeing this, here is that you're getting a significant improvement uh, in um, subjective improvement very quickly within the first few months of treatment, which is then maintained for, for after five years after treatment. There's various ways in which that can be improved. As some people talk about giving a second injection a few months afterwards if there's not been complete response. But what we see, again, looking at quality of life scores, is significant improvement within a relatively short space of time that's, in, that's maintained for up to five years. So I think at the moment we can conclude from these data that Bulkamid is quite safe, it's durable, it's easily administered, and it can be uh, lasting for a long period of time. And there's a, a big randomized controlled trial, which I know Tommy's organizing, uh, which is running at the moment and hopefully going to report, I think, sometime in the next 12 months or so, which I think will give us more information on that. And finally, um, we go back to the surgery that some of us looking around the room, there's probably not many of you who remember the old operations, but uh, the, the culpa suspensions, autologous fascial slings is what we used to do when we were growing up. Uh, these are very effective operations, but they are major abdominal surgery, and uh, it's, uh, they have significant um, morbidity associated with them that people have, seem to have forgotten. Uh, there's bleeding, there's de novo urgency, voiding dysfunction, and of course chronic scar pain, which you get from any surgical procedure, mustn't be forgotten either. And what we've seen, in, certainly in the UK recently, is a big shift away from people saying they don't want the retropubic tapes, they want to go back and have this culpa suspension, they want to have autologous fascial slings, without really understanding that these procedures are actually quite significant and uh, much more morbid, really, than the tapes, certainly from the, from the medical perspective. And the other, culpa suspension... Um, can be done laparoscopically, uh, but there are relatively few long-term studies looking at the results of them, so I don't think we can necessarily 
wholesale move towards that. And there is a significant posterior compartment prolapse problem with, with culpa suspension because of the anatomical derangement you get from that. So I think we need to be cautious about running, running back to old surgeries. With, in fact, although the surgeries are old, we don't have a lot of long-term robust data about them because they were being done in an era where robust data was not collected. So where do we go from here? Just to my last couple of slides. I think the important thing is we need to maintain high clinical standards and governance in surgery, and that would apply to any surgery. Um, the next comments I make really are barn door obvious to everybody, but it's surprising when you think about it that they haven't been happening. Surgeons who pref perform procedures for urine incontinence should have the appropriate training to do that procedure and work in a multidisciplinary team. They should provide detailed and appropriate consent to the patient before they do a procedure, and we've been working on what we call patient decision aids, which basically enable the patient to work through online a whole series of questions and, and seek out what their goals are so that they can actually decide whether the operation is the right thing for them. It's absolutely vital we, contain, we keep uh, good outcome data. Part of the problem with the mesh, the mesh issue is that people cannot go back and say, well, I've done 400 of these and my complication rate is this. The outcome data is not collected, um, and therefore it's very hard to answer the questions when people say the complication rate is very high. Um, the outcome data we have in our BSUG database suggests that actually the complication rate is very low, but it's limited data, and we don't have that. We need to make that mandatory going forward. Any complications that we get, should we, we should, as surgeons, own up to those, recognize it, report it, and learn from it. Um, and it's important that we learn that when women do have problems, we have appropriate ways of dealing with those, establishing multidisciplinary mesh removal centers, which we've now got 17 around the UK to deal with these problems. And finally, I think we do have to work with these patient groups to try and work out their full choice of procedures. We don't want to throw out good operations just because they happen to use mesh, but equally we have to recognize that there are many concerns that people have. So in summary, uh, overall, urinary incontinence is a common and debilitating condition. The majority of women can have their symptoms improved with simple measures in the community. They don't even need to come to see us. Medication remains the first line treatment for an over overactive bladder, but newer drugs are emerging and botulinum toxin is suitable for those women who have got refractory OAB. The surgical treatments for stress urine incontinence should only be considered if conservative therapy has failed. Bulking agents show a lot of promise and are a low risk option. Mid-urethral mid slings still have a place, but I think we have to be very cautious in, in how we apply that. Uh, but we shouldn't just be rushing back to doing major surgery without good evidence that is actually a better option. And finally, absolutely essential that surgeons who perform these operations have a duty to practice good governance. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Can you hear me well? Good. So I will talk about estriol, a vaginal gel for vaginal atrophy in breast cancer patients treated with ad adjuvant therapy with aromatase inhibitors. And this is a phase two prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study called the BLISAVE study. And this multicenter study was sponsored by the company ITF Research Pharma from Madrid, Spain. However, uh, the initiative actually came from the research group at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. The lifetime risk of breast cancer in the Western world is more than 10% today. And 70 to 80% of all breast cancer is estrogen receptor positive or progesterone receptor positive. And most postmenopausal women with hormone sensitive breast cancer are treated with aromatase inhibitors. And the purpose with this treatment is to suppress estrogen levels as low as possible. And today, the standard duration of treatment is five years. Uh, however, recently, it was demonstrated that extended treatment with aromatase inhibitors up to 10 years prolonged survival compared with placebo. So it may be that uh, we will recommend some women to extend the treatment uh, even uh, beyond five years. 
It's well known that women with breast cancer treated with aromatase inhibitors frequently suffer from symptoms of vaginal atrophy, such as vaginal dryness and dyspareunia. And we know that this could impact life quality considerably. And these symptoms are of course uh, uh, caused by estrogen deficiency. The recommended treatment today is vaginal moisturizers, which often have insufficient uh, efficacy. And today, local estrogen is not recommended due to the fear of systemic uh, absorption. However, we know that uh, there is a lack of compliance to uh, this kind of endocrine treatment, aromatase inhibitors. Uh, due to the negative side effects uh, of this treatment, and this is a great problem. Uh, local estrogens are the most efficient treatment of vaginal problems, but the safety in breast cancer patients must be confirmed. 0.05% uh, estriol vaginal gel is a formulation for local treatment of postmenopausal vaginal atrophy, which delivers an ultra-low dose of estriol, 50 microgram per application. And it's well known that estradiol is much less potent than estradiol. And furthermore, estriol, 50 microgram per dose, is 10 times lower than standard treatment with, for instance, uh, ovisterin uh, vagatorium of 0.5 milligram per dose. But still, the ultra-low dose of estradiol has shown efficacy in the relief of symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy. So the objective of this study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of 0.005% estriol vaginal gel for the treatment of vaginal symptoms in women with breast cancer receiving aromatase inhibitors. And the primary objective was to evaluate uh, the variation in serum levels of FSH from baseline to 12 weeks of treatment as a measure of systemic absorption. And secondary objectives were to evaluate levels of estriol, estradiol, uh, estron, and LH, and to assess the efficacy of symptoms and signs of vaginal atrophy, and to measure the effect of sexual function and safety and tolerability with this treatment. And this was a multi-center prospective study, with, uh, including five sites in Spain and one site in Sweden. And 61 patients were uh, recruited uh, having breast cancer treated with aromatase inhibitors and with moderate to severe uh, symptoms of vaginal dryness. And they were randomized to four to one, uh, 50 microgram es estriol, uh, or placebo for 12 weeks. And we were able to uh, include 21 patients in this study, and this was due to uh, support from a breast oncologist who referred patients to other, us. Otherwise, I think we would have great difficulties to recruit patients to this study. And here you can see the flow diagram of the study. Uh, during the first three weeks, uh, the participants uh, applied uh, study treatment daily, and thereafter it was an application twice a week. Uh, blood samples were collected before treatment after one, three, eight, and 12 weeks of treatment, and symptoms uh, and signs of vaginal atrophy uh, were evaluated before treatment after three weeks and 12 weeks. And um, uh, hormone levels were analyzed with the golden um, method, uh, LCMS, MS, which is very sensitive. 
The mean age of our patient was 59.2 years, and 50 patients received uh, active treatment with estriovaginal gel, and 11 patients um, uh, got the placebo. And at inclusion, about one third of the patients uh, had symptoms of moderate uh, vaginal atrophy and two thirds uh, severe symptoms of vaginal atrophy. And uh, uh, for you who have seen these patients, I, I mean, it could be very, very severe symptoms. And some patients had difficulties to just uh, undergo the examination. So um, it was sometimes terrible to see. And here you see the results of the primary outcome, FSH levels. Uh, and in this figure, uh, you can see the mean, the median FSH in the active group and in the placebo group. And in this figure, you can see the change in FSH levels from week one to baseline, week three, week eight, and week 12. And the variation in FSH levels after 12 weeks of treatment did not differ from the physiological variation uh, before treatment and not either uh, after eight weeks of treatment. Only uh, the variation at week one and week three, week three uh, exceeded the physiological variability. However, FSH levels uh, were all within the postmenopausal levels throughout the study. And the increased uh, variability after one and two weeks of treatment could possibly uh, be caused by a minimal but transient increase in estriol, uh, which uh, then decreased, as you can see here. And this increase was far below the normal postmenopausal range with its 10 picogram per mil. And you can see it, it, it reached uh, 4.5. Uh, serum estradiol and estrone levels uh, were below limit of quantification throughout the study. Uh, vaginal maturation index uh, increased compared to placebo, as you can see here already uh, at week three and vaginal pH decreased by active treatment. And furthermore, uh, signs of uh, vulvovaginal atrophy uh, improved, uh, such as here, vaginal dryness, then I need my glasses, uh, fragility of the mucosa, and thinning or flattening of folds, and the total sign index was um, uh, significantly improved by active treatment compared with placebo. Also, subjective symptoms of vaginal dryness improved significantly, significantly from week three and uh, week 12. And uh, also, uh, dyspareunia and pruritus uh, tended to improve uh, but the total symptom score was significantly improved by this ultra-low dose of uh, estriol. There was no significant adverse event during the study, uh, but some symptoms uh, uh, were reported in single women, uh, which could be related to, uh, to treatment, such as breast tenderness uh, in one woman. And there was uh, one unrelated uh, serious adverse event. So to conclude, these findings support the safety of 0.005% estradiol vaginal gel in women with breast cancer receiving aromatase therapy, uh, suffering from bothersome uh, vaginal symptoms. And there was a non-significant variation of FSH after 12 weeks of treatment and a minimal transitory absorption of estriol, whereas estradiol and estrone um, were not affected by the treatment. 
and all hormones were maintained within the postmenopausal range. And the results also confirmed the efficacy of this ultra low dose treatment in improving vaginal symptoms and signs of vulvovaginal atrophy in this population. So the clinical implications, local estrogen therapy may be considered in breast cancer patients with severe or resistant symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy following appropriate counseling with their oncologist. And for instance, in Sweden and particularly in Stockholm, I can notice a change in the attitudes to local estrogen treatment um, and also to these patients. And nowadays they have began to refer patients to me and I think this is a positive change. And for this population, low-dose estriol uh, may then be preferred instead of local estradiol, since estradiol is much more potent. And if long-term safety could be confirmed, guidelines or recommendations possibly could be changed to include all women with these symptoms. Thank you for your attention.